morning church today's reading is from mark chapter 8 27 to the first verse of chapter 9 This is the true gospel account of Jesus Christ according to Mark. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the, things of man, on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called, and he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul, for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said, them, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Noah. Uh, Let's pray as we come to God's word. Uh, Heavenly Father, would you teach us how to serve? Would you teach us how to enthrone you in our lives? and to serve each other and prefer one another's needs. Uh, Because as we do this, Heavenly Father, we are serving you and we are following the pattern that you have laid down for us. So Heavenly Father, help us to become more like Jesus, our servant King. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) Uh, What is the purpose of life? That's a big question for a Sunday morning, but what's the purpose of your life? I don't mean what is the kind of right answer to give to that question, but I mean what is it that really drives your actions and your decision making? And in society, what is it that drives our actions and our decision making? Increasingly, finding our purpose in life begins with an inward discovery and a search for self fulfillment. I'm sure you're aware of many cultural uh, trends that mo- are moving towards ourself or us, our self being the leading guide, the biggest factor. So we have many trends in identity, sexual fulfillment, and psychology. We see it in phrases such as be true to yourself, our self-love, and follow your heart. We're increasingly beginning with our self and our happiness as we move forward with our purpose in life. And we associate purpose in life with being happy. And so you can take a job, for instance. Uh, It is purposeful, is it purposeful and meaningful because it provides food and shelter for your family? Is that enough to give your job purpose? Previously, that was probably the main driving, satisfying factor with your work. Now today, 
Uh, it is purposeful not because of what it provides outside yourself, but we each want to have internal satisfaction and happiness with our work. Have you got your dream job? You want to be satisfied inside yourself rather than receiving things outside of yourself that give you purpose. And now you might be wondering, what's wrong with um, this inward happiness and pursuing that? I think partly we find that as we pursue that, we don't necessarily get happier. Um, but, as you, but also as you look inward, you tend to direct yourselves, not ultimately to things that are going to make you happy. And then there's certain things in life that you go through that are just not going to be about you or yourself. And so you can think of uh, having children and how they affect your life, your uh, personal purpose and happiness. They often don't. You have to give up and lose sleep and some of your leisure time, much of your leisure time, and you give up your money. And if your uh, purpose in life is is personal fulfillment from the inside out, then it's really not going to work to have children. Yet there is a purpose outside of yourself There is a way to find fulfillment outside of yourself as you love and nurture and serve others. You see, finding a purpose in life is not simple uh, or easy. Even this inward trend that we have, this inward trend of discovering our need for personal happiness or fulfillment or authenticity, uh, even that is a bit of a pushback against what wasn't the most helpful way of finding our purpose in life. It used to be more about conformity to society, getting your purpose from others. So I've lost count of the number of times that a senior lady has said to me, uh, in my day you could be a teacher, a nurse, or a receptionist. Uh, Is that purposeful and meaningful? For some, maybe, uh, but not really. Or you think of times that Christians have said, um, back in my day, being a Christian meant not drinking or smoking or gambling. Those were the markers of Christian life, of purpose. Don't do these things if you're a Christian. You see, you were conforming to others, uh, and sometimes what that meant for some people, that you had to hide very deeply any struggle you might have had with mental illness or your sexuality because there was such a strong push from outside that you found it incredibly stifling that through perhaps no fault of your own, you had to work very hard to fit in with someone else's purpose. And so there's a pushback to say, no, I'm not going to conform, but I'm going to be authentic to myself. I'm going to begin with myself, not what other people expect of me. You see, finding a purpose is not easy. If we look within, we do get a sense that we're going to become selfish, and ultimately not that happy as other things get in our way. If we look to others, we might find that their purpose is actually suffering, uh, suffocating, and not good for us. So how do we find the good and right purpose? Well, today we turn to Jesus in Mark 8, 35 to 9, 1. Jesus has something to say about our self, our focus, our purpose, as disciples and followers of him. A life driven not by ourselves uh, or by others, but by himself. And so first, I would like to begin, we're going to look at the the person of Jesus first. Learn about him, then his purpose, uh, and then the pattern that he lays down for us. So first, the person of Jesus. He was the Christ. This is verses 27 uh, to 30. Look with me at 27 and 28, though. And Jesus went out with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. As they are walking on their way, Jesus takes an opportunity to teach. Who do people say I am? Uh, This is a brilliant uh, question from Jesus. He's reeling in his disciples. Uh, He's letting them speak first about what other people say, giving them an an opportunity to think, to share what other people say, and then he's going to ask them directly, who do you say that I am? But this question, who is Jesus, is really the driving question of the whole Gospel of Mark. 
and the driving question, the question that Jesus would put to you and I put to you. Who was Jesus? Who do you say he was? You can tell this is the driving question for Mark and for Jesus for a couple of reasons. Uh, One is that over and over again, you would have noticed that the disciples didn't understand. After each miracle, the disciples were meant to learn and understand something about Jesus. And then Jesus comes along in this moment, and he asks them a question about understanding. Who do you say I am? Do you understand me? This has been what Jesus has been trying to get home to his disciples doing miracles. But the second reason is because in Mark's gospel, we have two great confessions about Jesus at key moments in the book. One here from Peter. It's at the very center of the book, and there's a big shift that happens in Jesus' life and intentions and teaching that happens when Peter finally says, you are the Christ. Uh, The second one is the Roman centurion at the cross just after Jesus has died. The centurion says, surely this is the Son of God. So Peter says, Jesus, you are the Christ. The centurion says, you are the Son of God. These two names that are given, and they're given also at the very introduction to Mark's gospel. Mark 1.1 says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's driving question is found here. Mark's driving purpose in the book is that you would understand who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of God. Who do you say that I am? Mark wants to lead us to a very particular conclusion about who Jesus was. The disciples gave a range of uh, answers to his question, who are people saying that I am? What's the talk out there? They say John the Baptist, uh, he had been beheaded, but some thought that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. We have Elijah, who was an Old Testament prophet, a great Old Testament prophet. Uh, He'd been taken up to heaven without dying, and so because of some teaching in the Old Testament, the Jews had this idea that he was going to return one day because he'd never died. And then others say one of the prophets. Together what they're saying is that, Jesus, people say you are a prophet and maybe even a great prophet, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. But this isn't enough. As full of praise as this is from others out there, it isn't enough. And today's, many of today's answers to this question of who Jesus was are not enough either. Uh, Muslims today will hold Jesus in very high regard. He was and is a great prophet to them. For others, Jesus is someone whose quotes you can add to other spiritual leaders, Gandhi, Buddha, Dalai Lama, whoever it is. For others, Jesus' teaching and philosophy and way of life and pithy sayings are like or greater than Confucius or Marcus Aurelius. This is someone who you listen to and go to in vice and pick up their pattern and way of thinking. Yet all of these views are not high enough for Jesus. And to, to place Jesus along with these people is ultimately to deny who Jesus was. You see, Jesus wasn't happy with these answers that the disciples given, had given. That is not who he was. He was not just a prophet. Because he was not just a prophet. He was the one whom all the prophets had pointed to. So look at verse 29. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. You are the Christ. Uh, Christ is not uh, Jesus' last name, although when we use his name, Jesus Christ, that's kind of how we think about it. But Christ, the Christ, is a word ripe with meaning and implication and history. It means anointed one, uh, like a king was anointed. And it is a word which holds within it the whole story of the Bible. It is a word which speaks to the whole history of human existence because there is one overarching story to this world that we live in. This world and God's purpose for it is certainly bigger than our inward selves and desires. We are part of the grand history of God. 
So back in Genesis chapter 3, at the very beginning of the world, God had promised that someone was coming to save the world from Satan's power, from the sin and all the horrible brokenness and suffering that we experience, come to crush and do away with that. And throughout Israel's history, many human kings had come and been anointed. They were anointed ones, small Christ in some ways. They'd been anointed and put on the throne of Israel, hopeful that they would fulfill this promise, that they would be able to do away with sin and create a wonderful, beautiful harmony here on earth. But none of them had been able to save God's people from sin, not even the great King David. But God promised King David, that someone was going to come who would sit on David's throne forever and ever and ever to rule the Christ. And here Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed king. Our purpose should begin with this person, the person of Jesus, the Christ, the eternal king. We submit ourselves our life to him. And that submission begins with the question from Jesus, who do you say that I am? Peter names Jesus, the Christ. You're the one promised from the beginning of the world. You have come to save the world from sin. He gets it. Well, he he almost gets it. Because you notice verse 30 there. Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Peter's still not able to talk about Jesus. Why not? He's confessed Jesus. You are the Christ. He got it right. Why, cannot he, why can't he tell people about Jesus? Well, you see, for Peter in this moment, if he had spoken about Christ, he would have spoken about the wrong Christ. He would have about told people about someone he didn't know properly. And here his, uh, and this is how I understand that strange double healing of the blind man in verse 20 to 26. Uh, Peter says, sees, but not fully. I uh, like the blind man who Jesus healed his eyes, but then he looked and he saw people, but he th- said they looked like trees. Peter, he sees Jesus, but he doesn't see him clearly. He needs a better vision, better understanding, Although it has begun, Peter is beginning to see who Jesus is. And so first we have the person of Jesus, he is the Christ. But second, we have the purpose of Jesus. So the person of Jesus, Christ. But second, we have the purpose of Jesus, where Jesus expands on who he is and what he's come to do for Peter. The purpose of Jesus is death and resurrection, verses 31 to 33. Here, te- uh, Jesus teaches more uh, fully an understanding of him so we can see Christ for who he is. So look at verse 31 and 32 with me. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Uh, Here is the first of three uh, passion predictions that I've called uh, where Jesus says, I'm going to die and rise again, where he knows and shows us his purpose. He was here to suffer and die and rise. Later, he would say that he came not to be served, but to give his life. Why? As a ransom for many, as a payment for many. He's giving his life to save us from sin, from the power of sin and Satan, giving us life, paying for the sin that we never could, forgiveness full and free from the Lord Jesus. And Mark tells us that Jesus said this plainly, meaning that this was no parable, no illustration, no analogy. Jesus is going to literally die. Yet Jesus does use the title, the Son of Man. The Son of Man. This Old Testament title, uh, because of uh, how it's used in Daniel, would have invoked for the disciples images of a king on his throne with absolute dominion over all nations forever and ever. 
And so at this moment, you can imagine his disciples getting quite excited. The Son of Man, Christ, has come. Our purpose is going to be to rule with Jesus forever and ever and ever over all nations. That's what they would have been thinking. And so what a surprise when Jesus says, the Son of Man will be rejected and die. This doesn't sit well with Peter. I look at verse 32, and Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Ouch. What a rebuke from Jesus. Jesus says, looks back at his disciples and perhaps he saw them wavering in their understanding and belief in Jesus. And so he strongly rebukes Peter. He wants his disciples to accept this teaching on his death. And we see in his response that to turn aside from Jesus' death and resurrection is to strike at the very heart of Jesus' purpose on earth. To ignore the rejected, dying, rising Savior is to be working with the purposes of Satan. This is a hard word, as hard a word as any from Jesus towards someone. But to deny his death, Jesus says, to deny my death and resurrection is a serious matter. And as you consider the answer to the question, who do you say Jesus is? This is central. He is not just a teacher but the eternal king who died and came to life again for your sin. You cannot put him aside other spiritual uh, guides. He is claiming much more. He is walking straight into his own death and predicting his own resurrection. And what's more, he is going to say that he is doing it for yours and my sin. And so to reject this about Jesus is to reject Jesus entirely. The purpose of Jesus, the, the person of Jesus is Christ, but the purpose of Jesus was this death and resurrection, and we must accept both. And thirdly, the pattern of Jesus is discipleship. The pattern of Jesus is discipleship, and it's cross-shaped discipleship as his life was. Look at verse 34 with me. And calling the crowd to him uh, with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To be a follower of Jesus, to answer that question, who do you say that I am, is more than a test of the correct answer. It's more than mere intellectual assent that you understand something. You need to do more than simply sign on the dotted line a doctrinal statement about who Jesus is. Jesus is not just someone for examination about what we believe, like a rock under a microscope that you can get your head around, think about, observe, examine. But in believing in Jesus, you are called to become like him. To believe is to become. It involves following the pattern of Jesus' life, embracing a new way of life with a new purpose, the way of death and resurrection. Jesus says there that we are to deny ourselves. That is the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a clashing command that is to the cultural themes of self-fulfillment we swim in. Deny yourself, your urges, your feelings, your cravings, your plans, your wants. Don't be authentic to yourself. Be authentic to the Lord Jesus. For what would it gain what would you gain to be completely fulfilled in yourself in this life and yet lose your soul in the next one? Deny yourself, Jesus says. Now, with most cultural trends, um, there is some truth to it. 
Uh, the Mama Bear book that the mums are going through talks about the spit and swallow technique, where you chew on something, you recognize what's good and helpful from that worldview or belief, and then you spit the rest out, you reject the rest. And so we do recognize that you need to look after yourself. You and I are unique human beings. We need rest and food and a long soak in a hot tub every now and then. Uh, we might not conform to other people's uh, patterns of life, so look after yourself. Look after yourself. But don't live for yourself. Uh, live for the Lord Jesus. Know yourself. Know who you are as different from others. But don't let that be the guide for your life. Follow the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ, his teaching and his life. Be able and willing to deny yourself for the sake of the Lord Jesus and others. But Jesus says more. He says, deny yourself and take up your cross. Uh, Jesus had just spoken plainly about his death, and he's speaking plainly here as well. Uh, he is talking about being a martyr and the most extreme, a willingness to die for the sake of your confession of Christ. Is that in us as a church? Are our purposes so fixed on Jesus, that we are willing to die following the pattern and life of the Lord Jesus. Taking up a cross also carries with it a sense of shame. Uh, we can guess at the, only guess at the sense of shame for being associated with a, cr a criminal, a convicted criminal put to death. That was Jesus. Jesus says, don't be ashamed of me and the life that I lived. You know, the Green Party has had some unfortunate events in uh, recent history of criminal conduct. And so you kind of start looking at the party and you think, oh, maybe the whole party's actually not got very good morals because there's this association. And what we're saying is that we associate with the Lord Jesus. And there's many things about him that people find wrong, bad, not good. His teachings are unacceptable. His life uh, was questionable. What he said about his death and resurrection wasn't true. So to be associating with Jesus is to be willing to bear that shame, to be viewed as different for what we believe about the Lord Jesus. We associate with Jesus. We side with the Lord Jesus. We are not ashamed to take up the cross of shame along with him. So Jesus says in verse 35, for what, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father. When everyone has a different purpose from you about how they should live their life and what is good and acceptable, when you are different, uh, take up, the cross of identifying with Jesus and with his words. Like Jesus, our life of discipleship is cross-shaped. It will cost us. We must deny ourselves, and it will bring shame. And I asked myself as I was preparing this sermon, why don't I say our discipleship is resurrection resurrection shaped. I'd much rather be able to say that. Why does it have to be cross shaped? Is that the best words to use? And the reason that I settle with cross shaped is because in this life, that is what Jesus calls us to. The way of the cross. Self-denial, cross bearing shame. The resurrection is coming. Our pattern follows Jesus as sure as day follows night. Today we have the cross, tomorrow the resurrection. But do look at verses 35 and 37 with me. We have to bear our cross, deny ourselves. These verses are filled with challenge, but I also think they're filled with promise from Jesus. Promise from him that it is worth denying and even dying for him now. So look at verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me, uh, is ashamed of me in my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus says, I am not giving you a bad deal in self-denial and even in death. He is offering you life and life eternal, salvation of your very soul to be taken to him. We could run around saving our life now, looking inwardly, seeking self-fulfillment, and in the end, we lose it all. Or we could give up our lives here and now in self-denial and find life in the Lord Jesus in the age to come. This is a purpose and an end to our lives. There is a purpose and end to our lives. It finds us before the Son of Man on his throne. And in light of that purpose, in light of that overarching story where everyone must stand before the Son of Man, we live in the pattern of his life, following him, submitting to him, unashamed of him. Jesus is the King, the Christ. His purpose is to suffer and die and rise, and he calls us to follow in this pattern of life. And Jesus uh, drives, I think, this hope and purpose a home in verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Jesus says, you're going to see this kingdom power for yourself. Uh, people go back and forth on what uh, they will see. Uh, my understanding is that they will see the resurrection power at work in the Lord Jesus Christ as he dies and rises to life. And as they see that, it would strengthen them of this reality of the cross-centered life as a disciple, that yes, they must suffer now as the Lord Jesus did, but they will see his power to rise again and they know that they will rise too. Jesus did rise to new life and we will as we follow him. So as we think back on this passage, a few questions for you. Are you settled on the person of Jesus? He's the Christ. Do you believe the purpose of Jesus, that he came to die and to rise to newness of life for your sin? And will you follow the pattern of Jesus, a cross-shaped discipleship? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, please do be at work in our lives so powerfully and so obviously that we are willing to deny ourselves, uh, take up our cross and follow you. Help us to have such a grand and wonderful view of the Lord Jesus come to die and rise and save us that we want to be just like him, following in his footsteps, willing to even suffer and die here, knowing that by, as we do that, we are saving our very soul. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.